Welcome to The Skin Reel, your guide to all things skincare, skin health, beauty, and more, curated by dermatologists and true skin experts. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Alice Mina. I'm a double board certified dermatologist and dermatologic surgeon with over a decade of clinical experience. If you're looking for real, practical, unhyped skincare guidance and expertise, or you just think the skin is really cool, then you're in the right spot. I'm so glad you've tuned in to The Skin Reel. Now let's dive in because this is how dermatologists talk skin. Hi everyone, quick disclaimer here before we start. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. If you're looking for help on your skin journey, please check out the American Academy of Dermatology's website, aad.org, where you can search their database for dermatologists near you. It is so important that you have someone in your corner who's well-trained, licensed, and board-certified who can help you make decisions when it comes to your skin health. Okay, got it? Great. Now for the fun stuff. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me on this week's episode of The Skin Reel. I am really excited. This week, we have Dr. Mara Weinstein on. And a few weeks ago, we had an episode talking about how to make the most out of your general dermatology visit. And this week, we're going to be talking about how to make the most of your cosmetic and your filler appointment with your dermatologist, because those are going to be really different appointments. And Dr. Weinstein is going to help shed some light and knowledge all about that. She is a board-certified dermatologist and the Director of Cosmetics and Laser Surgery at the University of Rochester Medical Center in upstate New York. She earned her bachelor's degree from Princeton and then went and did her dermatology residency at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, followed by a prestigious laser and cosmetic fellowship at Skincare Physicians in Boston. And we've actually had a, a bunch of the skincare physicians on the podcast recently. And one exciting thing that Dr. Weinstein and I connected over is that we both lived in Guam, which is a small Pacific island. So it was really fun to meet uh, someone else from Guam, although we didn't know each other (laughs) when we lived there. But anyways, Dr. Weinstein has received numerous awards. She's an invited speaker nationally. She has written tons of peer-reviewed articles and also uh, has co-authored several chapters in Dermatologic textbooks. So I am really excited to have Dr. Weinstein on today. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really my pleasure. I'm so glad that we connected over Guam and were able to touch base again in this podcast. Yes, uh, it's definitely a small world, right? That's right. Well, so I was really excited to have uh, Dr. Nasser on a few weeks ago, and we talked all about how to prep for your general dermatology appointment. And one of the things we talked about is that it's important to know whether you're going in for a general dermatology visit or a cosmetic visit. And so today, let's talk about the differences. Let's talk about what's important when you're going in for a cosmetic visit and in particular fillers. So why is that important for patients? Absolutely. Well, there's so many different things to consider. And this is something we talk about all the time with patients as to whether or not they're here for cosmetics or for general derm. Usually when a patient comes in for a filler appointment, for example, they're looking to make some tweaks in in their skin or, you know, their facial structure to just help brighten up their face. Oftentimes they might be prepping for an event like a wedding or bar bat mitzvah or birthday party or whatever it is. And they're just looking to learn a little bit more about what they can do to enhance their appearance. And when I say that, I say it very carefully because fillers, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking to change the way you look. It's just a nice technique to help enhance the way you look or to restore some volume back to your face that you've lost over time due to the natural process of aging. Yes, absolutely. You are still going to look like yourself after fillers, which I know is a big concern for a lot of patients. And sometimes I find patients will come in and they will say they want to talk about fillers, but they don't fully really know what that means. They've just maybe heard their friends have gotten it or someone they know has had it. And sometimes they're not even talking about fillers. They're talking about actually toxins. So can you just let us know what are fillers? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's important to distinguish. And, you know, I'll just start by saying, in general, a nice way to think about it is we use toxins for the upper face, right? So we use them to relax the way that our muscles move. So it prevents that nerve communicating with the muscle. So we don't form etch lines, typically in the upper face, think frown lines or forehead lines or that barcode across the forehead. So if you just sort of wrap your head around that, that's where toxins have a sweet spot. Fillers, on the other hand, are meant to replace volume that has been lost over time due to the natural aging process. So as we get older, we lose collagen, we lose that formation and production of collagen, it slows as early as age 26. And we also have some uh, mobilization of the bone structure in our face and some fat pads. And so all of this shifting creates areas that tend to look hollow or sagging. And that's where fillers come in. So we use them to replace volume in the lips, for example, or in the mid or lateral cheek or in the jawline. We can even use them in the neck and the chest. So if you just think about fillers as a technique to replace volume, that'll help to distinguish the difference between, you know, injectables in general. Yes. Yeah. So I describe fillers as sort of plumping up that balloon that's lost, uh, that's not quite as taut as it used to be versus toxins that we use on muscles of movement. So like you mentioned, raising your eyebrows and things like that. So yes, it's important to A, know the difference, but if you don't know the difference, it's not a big deal because that's why you're talking to your dermatologist, right? Exactly. (laughs) And the whole point of having a consult too is to go and talk about your options. And sometimes I'll find a patient will come in and they will think they're interested in one thing or another. And then once I actually have a chance to look at them and sort of see what bothers them, we actually come up with a totally different plan. Does that ever happen to you? All the time. It happens every day. And I think that is really the beauty of communication and education that we do in the office, right? As board certified derm surgeons, we've spent over 13 years of schooling to really hone in on the intricacies of the face and facial structure and the body and the skin. And so that all reveals itself in our conversation on that initial consultation. Yes, absolutely. And I like what you mentioned earlier, a lot of times it is a big event or something important coming up in the patient's life that will bring them in, especially for that first visit. And that's where they want to discuss what options are available and and fillers in particular. Now, if someone does have a big event coming up, do you recommend that they see you a week in advance, a couple of days in advance, a month in advance? What do you recommend? I recommend at least eight weeks in advance. So you can cheat and do six to eight weeks, but at least that time frame to really give yourself a chance to figure out what it is you want to achieve and then also have the product or the treatment be able to settle into your skin. And so you're used to that new look. Uh, maybe take a few pictures, make sure you like the way it looks before that big event. Yes. Great, great advice. Please don't come the week before your wedding or your daughter's wedding. Because the other thing is you can bruise. And no matter how good an injector you're seeing or dermatologist, bruising can happen. And it can depend on if, uh, you know, what Uh, supplements you take or medicines. And we would hate for you to get a big bruise or any bruise right before a big event. So that's another reason to push it back. And, And I agree, at least several weeks, if not one to two months, even though filler is immediate in its action, right? I do think it takes several weeks for it to really settle in and look natural. Yes, I agree. And especially with the, well, there are so many different types of fillers, right? So if we kind of break it down, the most commonly used filler is comprised of hyaluronic acid, which is a naturally occurring sugar molecule in our bodies. And it is then formulated into a gel substance that comes in a vial and we inject it um, by the vial. And there's different formulations that are appropriate for different areas of the face, right? So we can use a thinner, let's say thinner formula to inject into fine lines lines, finely etched lines around the mouth, for example, or in the lips, and a thicker formula to inject into, you know, the deep cheeks to really lift and give volume. So there's so many different types of fillers and so many different formulations. And I think it's important also for patients to understand that which one we choose or which one is appropriate for you might not be the one that your best friend just had. And so when patients come in, 
I often find they come in if, if they know they want filler and they say, you know, I want this kind of filler. And we assess and we talk. And another point is that education piece. We, you know, that might not be the right filler for them. So I explain the different types and what's appropriate for wear on the face or, you know, the body. And we go from there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes it's less important which filler, but use the one that your dermatologist is recommending and that they have the most familiarity with because they will be able to make that filler look amazing because they know how it feels, how it handles, they know how to place it correctly. So don't worry so much about which name brand per se. I would say really trust your dermatologist instincts, especially if they do a lot of these procedures. That's right. The other important thing to know about your filler appointment is to kind of be prepared for what to expect that day. So come in with a clean face, no makeup. Oftentimes we're waiting 10, 15 minutes for patients to wash their makeup off. Um, and, and we get it, you know, you might be coming from work, but it's important to know that we're going to ask you to remove your makeup so that we can really assess and evaluate the facial structure at that time without, you know, contouring. It's also important to point out if you have cold sores or if you get cold sores often, because if we're injecting around the mouth, it could stimulate a cold sore or aggravate one. And we certainly wouldn't want to do that. The other thing to note is if you have a dental appointment coming up in the next two weeks, or if you had one two weeks in that time frame uh, within two weeks prior to your appointment. And the reason being there is with dental appointments, especially after filler, the dentist, you know, is going to be in your mouth and manipulating tissues in the lips and the cheeks, possibly and most likely areas where the filler was placed. So you don't want that manipulation to alter the placement of your filler. And the second point with dental procedures is oftentimes it requires an injection of anesthesia. And so in theory, that needle injection point can seed bacteria from your mouth into your cheek or into your skin where the filler was placed and then lead to an infection. So we always counsel that you avoid dental procedures at least two weeks. You wait at least two weeks after you have filler. Yeah, that's a great point. And I would also just mention when you're coming in, especially for your first time for a filler appointment, even though you're coming in for cosmetic, purely cosmetic, we still need to know about any past medical history, past surgeries that you've had. Please make sure you have your medicines up to date. And again, it would be key to know if you're on blood thinners, aspirin, and um, certain supplements, right? So even though it's just a, you know, you may say it's just a cosmetic visit, why do they need to know? But these things are important. And to your point about cold sores, things like that, we need to know that. So be prepared to have that ready to go so that we can um, have a complete history from you. Yes. And in terms of supplements, it's easy to remember if you just think about all the G's, right? So garlic and ginkgo and ginseng and green tea, all of these things can thin your blood. And most people don't even realize um, that that is a fact. I have a lot of patients who are avid green tea drinkers and you know they'll be particularly oozy that day and we'll say did you know did you have green tea today or coffee and they'll say yeah I had a big cup of green or a big mug of green tea this morning and so that's just something to know and then in terms of bruising of course um, anti-inflammatory so ibuprofen aspirin um, any blood thinning medications definitely talk to your doctor about that before you come in could be stopped about two weeks prior and then ways to prevent bruising I'm not sure if you do this in the office, but a lot of people counsel on eating pineapple or taking bromelain supplements two weeks prior to your filler appointment, which bromelain is an enzyme that can help prevent uh, bruising. And then also Arnica comes in a cream or even a pill supplement that patients can take after the appointment to help reduce swelling and prevent bruising. Yes, definitely. And those are great tips. And, you know, if a bruise does occur, sometimes you can um, have it zapped out with laser if you've got something important coming up, but you also can wear makeup and camouflage it if needed. Yeah, that's the great thing about filler is post-treatment, there's really nothing to do. There's really no restrictions besides the dental appointment point that we made. I don't usually counsel on, you know, restricting exercise or any, anything really, yeah. um, as just, as long as you're not massaging your face exactly um, with hyaluronic acid fillers 
or going in for a facial or something like that um, soon afterward. Yeah, we're we're kind of more talking towards those hyaluronic acid fillers, aren't we? And instead of the biostimulatory molecules, which are not technically fillers, but yes, they do fill <laughs> the volume. But yeah, I don't I don't routinely recommend. In fact, I say don't massage, don't don't touch. Let your natural movements and talking, speaking, things like that move the filler where it wants to be. Now, we mentioned not wearing makeup, come in prepared with your medical history and all that. What happens when you're actually in the room with the doctor and you're ready to get your filler? What are sort of the next steps? Yeah, so that is, that's the fun part, right? So I give you a mirror or usually use a mirror in the office and we sort of break down the areas that we're going to work on that day, particularly around the mouth can be very painful. And so if that's the case, we apply some numbing medication there and it's just a cream that sits on the skin for about 30 minutes and that really helps take the edge off and makes the procedure very comfortable. And so if we are injecting around the mouth or the lips, we'll apply that numbing and so there's a little bit of downtime there. But let's say we're going straight for the cheek. So there's two different techniques that can be used for filler. Um, The first is with a needle and it's usually a very small gauge needle. It just feels like a little pinch when injected. We give you a little stress ball to hold, which uh, a lot of patients love and it helps. And the other technique is with something called a cannula, which is actually a long but blunt tip device. And so we use a needle to make a little hole or a port to advance the cannula. And then once the cannula is under the skin, we inject the filler. And it's usually, again, a very comfortable procedure. So there's not much to it other than a little bit of pain on that initial prick, but most patients tolerate it very well. And, you know, afterwards we might hold some pressure. It's totally normal for some areas to bleed. We hold pressure. We might notice this, you know, first signs of a bruise. And so we can address that as well. But it's a pretty quick visit, I would say. Nothing really to it other than the numbing portion, which you might not plan for initially, and then the injections. Yeah. So if you are going to have the numbing, there is that downtime initially. And most of the hyaluronic acid fillers, in fact, maybe all of them have numbing lidocaine in them. And so once the first pricks, you'll feel a little bit, but then it it numbs the area anyway. So it's pretty comfortable for most patients, I would say maybe with the exclusion of the lips. <laughs> so those can be a little tender and um, I'll even do a block uh, for some patients there if they don't mind being numb for a little bit because it can be, it, it can smart, it can sting for sure. Yeah. And, you know, with filler, the great thing is, like you said earlier, is that immediate result, right? So the beautiful thing about lips is after they're injected, you can look in a mirror and you can see that augmentation. And it's just such a wonderful thing to a gift, I think that we can give to patients. Um, Most often, they're very happy. Yeah. And um, usually, initially, it looks a little more swollen. So sometimes, I'm not sure if this happens with you. But a few days later, they'll call and say, Oh, I liked the swelling, I want to come back for more. (laughs) Exactly. I usually will will joke like, well, you know, the good news is, uh, you know, you're gonna have a little swelling and they actually like that swelling. But I do find yeah, lips will swell sometimes even the next morning, I'll tell them, hey, you may wake up and feel like, oh my gosh, my lips are really swollen. And it's it's just the swelling from laying flat and that subsides. And I also find under the eyes, the tear trough area, you can get a good bit of swelling the next morning. And I tell patients to put some ice on it and that subsides. But you're, you're right. Sometimes they prefer that with the extra swelling too. Do you do much filling of the hands or neck or chest? Are there like all face areas? Yeah, uh, definitely the hands. And I, uh, Uh, We'll use a little different, I'll do more of a biostimulatory filler there and a little bit on the neck mixing. What about you? Agreed. So I like to use biostimulatory fillers in those areas. And these are fillers that are a little bit more liquidy as they go in. Um, And so the result isn't as immediate. We do have to wait for it to stimulate collagen. That's that's the beauty of these. Um, And they're also thought to be a little more natural. So patients who don't like or don't like the concept of that immediate plump from hyaluronic acid will often turn to the biostimulatory fillers. But I do quite a bit on the neck. It helps with that that crepey neck appearance Mm -hmm. and gives a little bit of tightening and sort of gives it a little 
oomph, I would say, right? As we get older and things sort of start to look thinner and more drawn. Yeah. And then for the chest, I find it really helpful for those vertical lines that start to form in the, the creases, especially where the breasts kind of come together. And we've had patients as young as, you know, late 20s come in for this, um, who maybe have a, a large chest and have noticed the skin sort of creasing in that area. Also, you know, history of sun damage or sunburns to the decollete can augment the look of that. So that's really where I find biostimulatory fillers to be helpful for the chest. Yes, absolutely. I, I think those are great when you need a little more bang for your buck, right? And I'll dilute it pretty thin. Mm-hmm. And the results, like you said, are not as dramatic initially, but over the long term, I think you get better fill and more natural results with that. And one thing we didn't mention earlier that I always try to do religiously with all my patients is take before pictures, because you only have one chance to take that before picture. And a lot of my patients, at least here where I practice, they are going for a more natural conservative look and they're really nervous that one syringe of filler is going to make them look overdone. And so I like to do these before pictures and then I can show them what it looks like and it helps reassure them that, you know, they don't look overdone and usually they end up wanting more. That's right. Pictures are priceless, um, especially that first visit. We do a series of six to 10 or so pictures prior to the visit. And we have everybody wear a headband. So your hair is completely out of the way. It's not a great look. (laughs) Most patients don't like to see those pictures, but it really gives you an accurate representation of facial structure. Yes. And that's when we boil down to it, that's really what we're looking at. Yeah. And so, we, yes, we do the pictures. But in terms of the syringes, so I think it's important for our listeners to hear that one syringe is a fifth of a teaspoon. So if you think about giving your child medication and a teaspoon, it's a fifth of that. Yeah. Um, and it's really not a lot. It's nothing. Right. And But even with one syringe, we can make a difference. Yes. There's there's really nothing to be scared of in terms of the the quantity there. And I find that if someone really does need a lot of filler, no one really wants to buy five syringes of filler. Then I'm I'm looking more towards the biostimulatory products that are going to give them a more bang for their buck over the long term and and more volume uh, replacement. But yeah, it's one syringe. I mean, sometimes I don't even use the full syringe and and we save it for them (laughs) for touch ups later. So yeah, you're definitely not going to be overdone, especially if it's placed correctly with one syringe. Yes, agreed. Let's kind of talk about um, expectations then, right? And, and realistic expectations. What what can we achieve with filler and what we can't? What are some things you wish patients knew about expectations with their filler appointment? That's a great question. So my first rule of thumb is if you can pull your skin back and say, I want it to look like this, that's not a realistic expectation. So we're not pulling and tugging on the skin. If that's the desired result, um, I usually will say, why don't you consult with a plastic surgeon and then circle back and we can realistically think about what filler can accomplish for you. But when I look in the mirror with the patient and we manipulate little areas of the cheek, for example, or the tear troughs, I think those are realistic expectations. Replacing volume in a natural way that doesn't dramatically lift or tighten the skin um, is what you can expect. Um, I also think that there's a cumulative effect to filler. So the little bit you get early on can really help build and promote collagen in those areas. And so over time, you might need less and less if you really keep up with it. And then the last expectation is it doesn't last forever. So filler in different areas of the face will last different amounts of time. And it's different forever. And depending on you know age or quality of skin, your metabolism, how active you are, just what your body does with this substance. And we find that around the mouth, it tends to last a little bit um, less than in, you know, areas where you place it a bit deeper, like the cheeks. Also, the mouth and lips are highly mobile areas. And so it's not going to last as long in those areas. And so typically, we say about, you know, like six to nine months around the mouth, and then cheeks, jawline, other areas might last about 12 to 18 months. And that does depend on what type of filler you're using. 
Yes. Yeah. Great points. And if you've never done any filler products and you come in at 70, you are going to need a lot more than someone who has been doing a little bit along the way, even starting in their 20s or or 30s. So that's such a great point. I do find it builds, it stimulates your own collagen and you never quite, even when the filler wears off, you never quite go back to where you started, which is another perk of doing it. So you may be surprised if your dermatologist says you need a couple syringes in the beginning, but what you'll notice is that you won't need that every visit by any means. That's right. And patients often time these filler appointments with their neuromodulator appointments. So if we see you for a toxin every four months, then, you know, inevitably we'll meet at one point, let's say every year and we'll reassess filler and the need for filler. And sometimes like with tear troughs, we can go two years without refilling tear troughs. Yes. Yeah. That's an area that really seems to last. So I like I like that. But yeah, the more mobile the areas, it it doesn't seem to last quite as long. But again, you never quite reset to where you started. So that's an all great point. Can you share maybe three final tips for someone thinking about getting fillers what you as a cosmetic dermatologist would uh, want them to know? Yes, I can. Um, So number one, know your provider. Do your research, look them up. There are so many options out there. I can totally understand it's overwhelming, but you want to look for a board certified dermatologist or dermatologic surgeon who has specialized training in injectables and cosmetics. They are going to be your best bet. They really understand the facial anatomy, the structure, the science behind aging, and all of the processes we mentioned today. So that's my number one, number one, number one. Know your provider, do your research, and don't mess with your face. This is not worth a Groupon procedure. This is your face um, and your body. These are injections, things going into your body. So that's my number one for sure. Number two, don't be afraid of filler. There's nothing wrong with coming in for a consult, discussing your concerns, saying, you know, I'm going to go home and think about it and and make a follow-up appointment. That's okay. Don't feel A, that you have to do it the day of the consultation and B, that, you know, it's going to make you look fake or unnatural or somebody's going to find out. Because if you follow number one, which is going to your uh, known provider, then you can assure that your results are going to look natural. And I oftentimes find that patients will say, you know, their friends say, did you get a lot of sleep last night? Or did you just come back from vacation? You know, did you get a haircut? So something's different and better, but they can't pinpoint what what it is. And that's, that's gold. Yeah, that that's what we're going for, right? You don't want people to know you had something done. You just want them to say, wow, you look really great. Exactly. Um, and number three, you have to keep up with your anti-aging processes and visits. This is all maintenance. So rarely anything in life is one and done. And so really think about it as a taking care of yourself step. Um, you know, step in self care and health and maintenance. If you go to see your dermatologist for these procedures and there's something concerning on your skin or anything on your skin that looks abnormal, they're also highly skilled, trained physicians and oftentimes can catch or address or answer questions about things that you might have been wondering um, that are just happening on your skin. So, it's sort of a double benefit to seeing yeah. a board certified dermatologist. So number three is really to maintain a schedule for yourself and check in with your dermatologist for those. Yeah, that's a great point you brought up at the end. I don't know how many times someone's come in just for a cosmetic thing. And I'm like, well, we can do filler, but let's also address this <laughs> lesion on your nose. And um, and it's a great time during the filler appointment to also just talk about other anti-aging strategies for someone. Because if you're coming in for filler, it lets me know that you are wanting to invest in yourself and look as good as you feel and maintain. And so we can also talk talk of that visit about how important wearing sunscreen and staying out of the sun and and having a, a good skincare routine can help. So 
and all great reasons to uh, be seeing your board certified dermatologist for sure. Well, Dr. Weinstein, this has been a lot of fun, really informative. Where can our listeners find you or follow you if they want to learn more about what you're up to? Yes, thank you. I would love that. Um, I love the engagement and and being able to educate and, and thank you for having me. So I have a page on Instagram. It's at Dr. Mara Weinstein. And I also have a TikTok account, uh, which is very fun. And it's at Dr. Mara Weinstein. So very easy. I'm also on Facebook. Um, if anybody is interested, it's it's the same handle at Dr. Mara Weinstein. And I'm looking forward to engaging with everybody offline. Yeah, awesome. Or online. Yes, <laughs> totally online. Uh, we will definitely add that to the show notes. So um, definitely everyone be sure to check out Dr. Weinstein's handles on social media. So thank you so much. And we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Skin Reel. I hope it's been informative, educational, and perhaps a little entertaining. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to like and subscribe and share with a friend. Don't want to stop your learning just yet? Head on over to theskinreel.com for show notes, blog posts, and so much more. Until next time, skin friends. Skin Reel.